The first time I heard Bluebeard's Castle, I was taken aback. I, I took my headphones off and thought, what on earth was that? <laughs> what can we do with that? I always wanted to conduct it. When I heard it for the first time, I, I was just completely overwhelmed by it. And it's, for me, it's one of the most powerful pieces in, in the entire repertoire, written by anybody, by any standards ever. And my hair stands up when, when I conduct it, you know, when I hear it. I mean, there are moments when it just goes like this. Bluebeard is an opera, um, no question, but it's an opera where there's practically no physical action and it all happens within the minds of the people. And I thought that when everything is psychological and, and internal, video would be perfect for this. And of course, I had extremely good experiences from working with, with Nick in the rewrite already, so I, I, I felt that this is the right, right person to do this. The project began about 18 months ago with uh, Richard Slaney from the Philharmonia Orchestra asking me and my team to come up with uh, a concept for Bluebeard's Castle. I still get excited having heard it every day for nearly a year. I love listening to the motifs that keep coming back in and they very much informed what we, what we decided to do with the visuals and following certain musical patterns and trying to weave in that kind of narrative and also the subtext. And, and what's going on behind the story is what's so fascinating about this piece. One of the key things we wanted to avoid was a, a large screen uh, hanging above the orchestra's head, um, which can work sometimes, but can often appear to dwarf the orchestra. Um, and we wanted to find something which is a bit more immersive. So we spent ages looking at different plans and different ways of doing it. It's quite a simple idea, really. A, a, a motorised central screen that opens out like a piece of origami. So with each turning key, rather than having a literal lock or a literal key, we came up with this idea that we would have a, a growing shape that would expand and open until the final room where it closes in on Judith as she's trapped inside the castle. working with a company called Souvenir, we put together a plan that we could build very quickly in a venue. The set was designed first on paper, and then we've worked within the Royal Festival Hall and within Souvenir to, to test it out and make sure that, that it all works properly. We wanted the space to be quite dreamlike. There's an element of macro in most of the areas because we wanted quite a tight um, field of view where you could never really understand the whole space of what you're looking at. So for the treasury, for example, like this is the whole thing and just this tiny rock has created a space for five minutes. We needed to evoke um, the kind of splendour and richness of gold but we didn't want to go into gold chains and coins and pearls because it just felt like we'd be filming a set and it would just feel very much like if we went that way we would have to kind of create a space and we didn't want a space to exist it just feels a little bit wrong and a little bit dreamlike and that was one of our goals Today we're down at RAG Studios in East London filming the final room of Bluebeard's Castle. We've, we've rigged a set involving some moving headlights and a frost screen which enables us to get different coloured silhouettes. We've been shooting here for six hours now on two different cameras. We've got a lot of stuff. Some of it's great, some of it's not so great. So we're going to go into an editing process and uh, it's only, a, I think we've got six and a half minutes to fill of screen time. But what we'll be doing is we'll be layering up a lot of the footage and um, trying to give a, a, a dreamlike sense to, to the stuff that we filmed today. I'm ready. Three, two, one, go. Okay, those should castle walls. 
Sai. Standby Q14. Q15. It should look really simple when you're in the space. Standby you shouldn't have Q to see this. 16. You shouldn't know that this is all going on because we've really tried to keep it seamless and that you might not even notice when there are changes. But for those that are looking for them, there are changes all the time. And it's a, it's a technical minefield and a lot of maths. Stand by and go. And go. Stand by. And this go. is crunch week for us. We've got three days now to program the rest of the show. Uh, we've got some rehearsals coming up in, a, in just over two weeks time. In terms of what, what we need to do is finish the program and sit down with a show caller and make sure that uh, she's co completely on point with where we want to bring in each new visual. Um, and then we enter a pretty hectic tour schedule which starts with a rehearsal at the Royal Festival Hall and then we rush up to Birmingham and do the first gig. And then from Birmingham we go to Lisbon and then we can have a short breather before we do the show in London and we finish up in Dortmund. Okay, move it. I feel confident. I'm probably gonna hate myself for saying that in a month, but I feel confident that it's really strong. I've never seen something like this integrated into a semi-stage production with an orchestra on stage. I hope, I hope that people will love it. Um, and there's a very deliberate arc that's been drawn, which hopefully will draw people in and then take them on the journey. Well, let's face it, operas are long. But this is a one hour thing, and it, as I said, it goes like an arrow straight into the bullseye. And I think everybody can kind of reflect his or her, her own fears and phobias and hopes and disappointments and, and dark sides of one's personality into this. And if you want to see your first opera, I think you should come to this one.